This is Kenyon College Television News with your anchors, Brendan Keefe and Ed Curtis. Field reporters, Carla Bernberg, Karen Devine, Sam Samberg, and Colin Parker. Hello and welcome to Kenyon College Television News for March 28th. I'm Brennan Keefe. And I'm Ed Curtis. As underclasspersons have surely noticed from the thick packets slipped under their doors, the lottery process has officially begun. Today, the results of the lottery for the two college houses will be posted in the dining halls with selection procedures following tomorrow, March 29th at 7 p.m. in the KC. Far Hall and single room lottery forms are due by noon, April 2nd, the results of which will be posted Wednesday, April 4th, with selection the following evening. Students interested in living in the six-person new apartments and the six-person Capel Suites should have their registration form, forms in by Monday, April 9th, the results of which will be posted the 11th for the selection on Thursday the 12th. And students interested in living in the four-person new apartments and Bexley's have your forms in by April 16th. This is a bunch of information, isn't it? Don't forget, and if you have any questions, consult your lottery packet. Brendan? We're sure the news has spread by now, but for those of you who have been cut off from the rest of the world or haven't seen last week's issue of Sports Illustrated, the swimming Kenyan lords and ladies have done it again, winning this year's NCAA Division III Swimming Championships. This makes the 11th consecutive swimming championship victory for the Lords and the 7th consecutive victory for the ladies. It seems as though the Kenyan swimming dynasty will never end. We'd like to congratulate both the Lords and the ladies for their respective victories and wish them a successful season for next year. Common Grounds, the student-run coffee shop, is expanding to the library. Now from Sunday through Thursday evenings from 9 p.m. to midnight, you can find your favorite caffeine-packed coffees, teas, and cookies in the atrium of the Olin Library. Library personnel report, however, that the existence of the coffee shop is conditional. If food or drinks are found elsewhere in the building, or if care is not taken to keep the atrium clean, Common Grounds will lose its library sales privileges. Common Grounds hopes that students respect the library's rules, take a study break, and enjoy some goodies at the atrium. We'll have a more complete story on this big move next week. As if trying to read lips to learn gossip in the dining halls isn't enough, the senior class committee is sponsoring a lip sync competition this Friday from 8 to 10 p.m. in Ross Hall. The contest will feature Kenyan students attempting to flap their lips in synchronous to the music of their choice. Admission is $1 at the door, and we are told that there will be some great prizes for the winners. Of course, KCTV will have footage of that lip sync competition next week. A new intramural sport can be seen around campus this spring. With the initiative from several Kenyan students, a new women's softball club has been formed. Practice began before spring break, and games are scheduled to be played on Saturday afternoons with regional competition. As required by the NCAC, the team has to play for two years before it can seek to have varsity status at the college. KCTV will have an in-depth report on the new women's softball club next week. The Black Student Union celebrated its 20th anniversary this past weekend with many events continuing through this week. As part of the celebration, the Black Student Lounge in Pierce Hall was renovated and refurnished. The refurbishing included the addition of a new television, new carpeting, new sofas, and new study carrels. In addition, several frame prints were placed on walls throughout the lounge. One of these prints depicts two black hands in a tug of war with the American flag, illustrating the ongoing struggle for racial equality in the United States. The Black Student Lounge is on the second floor of Pierce Hall, across from the Bemis Music Room. Gary Snyder, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, will be visiting Kenyon March 29th. During Common Hour at 11 a.m. in Pierce Lounge, he will hold a discussion about art and politics with loose professor Lewis Hyde. Mr. Snyder will present a reading of his poetry at the Hill Theater at 8 p.m. with a reception following in Pierce Lounge. All are, of course, welcome. Social Board, along with faculty lectureships, will be presenting Sweet Honey in the Rock, the female a cappella singing group in Ross Hall this April 8th. They're expecting an overflow audience for the event and have accordingly devised a pre-ticketing procedure. The first ticket distribution will be this Friday, March 30th, um, in the KC from 12 noon to 1 p.m. For this distribution, you must have a student ID or some other form of identification. 
proving that you are either enrolled as a student in the college or your employment with the college. Immediate relatives of employees are also eligible for this distribution. Tickets will be distributed on a first-come, first-served basis, and each individual in line will be, will be able to receive only one ticket. Each person may proxy for one other individual. However, you must have identification for that individual as well. Additional distribution times and other distribution information is posted around campus and in Newscope. And there's certainly a lot going on tomorrow night. Soprano Marjorie Bennett will be giving a recital Thursday, March 29th at 8 p.m. in Ross Hall. An instructor of music at Kenyon, Bennett has performed with the Graz Austria Opera Company, Opera Grand Rapids, Opera Columbus, and the Shreveport Orchestra. Accompanied by pianist Paul Dorgan, Bennett will sing selections including German Leader, 19th Century Opera, and African American Spirituals. When we first come to Kenyon, we hear many stories of Philander Chase's historic climbing of the hill and founding the college. Likewise, we hear the heavily embellished stories of college pranks and antics of such famous alumni as Jonathan Winters and of Paul Newman. But have you ever wondered how these stories are perpetuated? KCTV's Karen Devine talked with Kenyan legend Thomas Greenslade and filed this week's KCTV News profile. For most Kenyan students, their time in Gambier is an important but very brief period of their lives. Some Kenyan alumni, however, retain very close ties with Gambier. Thomas B. Greenslade, class of 1931, is one such alumnus. Undoubtedly, you've all walked past these windows, but few Kenyan students know what a wealth of Kenyan history lies inside. In 1967, Mr. Greenslade returned to Kenyon as college archivist, who is in charge of organizing and preserving information about Kenyon. I recently spoke with Mr. Greenslade about his Kenyon experience during the 1930s and why he returned to Kenyon. I think the reason I came to Kenyon was because uh, I, would, I was a member of the Episcopal Church and our local Episcopal priest <laughs> was a Kenyan graduate. And um, I came from a small town high school and in those days we didn't have any guidance counselors or anything like that. And so the, um, the place just appealed to me. I came down here and was even then entranced with the beauty of the place. How did Kenyon differ from the college we know today? As far as the buildings are concerned, the only buildings in those days were the three dormitories down at the south end. Uh, Leonard had just been built, Hannah, of course, and then Old Kenyon. Uh, I lived in Old Kenyon for the first uh, year, and then I moved to, to Leonard the, the second year. And Leonard, Leonard, even in those days, was quite different from what it is now. Much more comfortable room arrangement than, than then. Ross Hall was the gymnasium. Uh, it had been the chapel, as you probably know, originally. Uh, it had a flat floor in those days. Uh, the games were, uh, were held uh, with um, uh, bleachers on each side. Out of bounds was in somebody's lap. <laughs> the um, the um, uh, locker rooms were in the basement. As a matter of fact, I, I never go into the music department without kind of sniffing to see if I can still detect that old locker room odor that used to be there. <laughs> uh, social life was uh, concentrated on the weekends, <laughs> perhaps as they are now. Everyone went, went around with, uh, in very casual clothes all, all during the week, and then weekends everyone got dressed up. There were only uh, uh, two or three big social events in the year. Uh, the fall dance, the May Hop, believe it or not, that's what it was called, the May Hop. And, um, and, and these were tremendous social events. Every activity stopped. The, uh, there was a, 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 a dance on Friday night and a, a tea dance the next afternoon, Saturday night and then a big dance on, uh, on Saturday night. Uh, some of the best bands in the country came here at that time. It was the big band era, just before the big band era. And uh, alcohol was forbidden on the campus, but of course everyone had alcohol. Uh, the um, the uh, liquor was mostly corn liquor that came from New Straitsville, Ohio, where there were abandoned mines over there. And the, 
the, uh, the uh, former miners were making uh, corn liquor in, their, uh, in these abandoned mine shafts. Uh, the, the beer came from Newark. And uh, then um, there was a, uh, quite an abundance of what we call bathtub gin, which was made simply by uh, mixing alcohol with water and a little oil of juniper. And the aging time was perhaps 30 minutes, something like that. <laughs> so the social life then was, was quite different from what it is now, uh, in that uh, there were no women, of course, uh, officially on the campus, uh, as students at least. What influenced your decision to come back to Gambia? Well, uh, uh, I always had a very great interest in Kenyon. And even though I was a science person, I, uh, I always was interested in history. And so when this uh, little job of archivist uh, happened to open up just at that time, uh, I decided to come back here. I always thought that I would like to retire to a college town. And it, it's been very good here because there's hardly a night goes past but what there isn't a play or a concert or a, a lecture or an athletic contest or something. And uh, my wife and I to go, go to most of them. Aside from his work in Olin, Mr. Greenslade is very well known for his historical tours of the campus. He has an interesting story about nearly every place on campus. Uh, in my day, of course, the, all of the students were here for chapel every morning. Uh, and the whole body, uh, the whole student body of 250 were seated in here. As a freshman, you started out way at the back. And uh, as a sophomore, you moved up a little bit. And then as a senior, you sat over here where the, uh, the seat of honor was. In those days, uh, we had to go to chapel every morning <laughs> at quarter of eight in the morning. And it was quite a job to get here at the time. And if there was one thing that they would throw you out of college for in those days, it was overcutting chapel. You could get drunk and pass out on the president's front steps. <laughs> and th that, that could be condoned. But cutting chapel and you were out. Mr. Greenslade is here in the archives from 9 a.m. to noon, Monday through Friday, and is more than willing to talk with students or anybody who's interested in the history of Kenyon. His recollections of his undergraduate days, combined with his ongoing research, make Mr. Greenslade a very interesting person with whom to talk. This is Karen Devine for KCTV News. And now in the studio we have John Grant and Bill O'Hearn with their guest, political science professor Fred Bauman, for this week's edition of On the Hill. Thank you. I'm Bill O'Hearn. And I'm John Grant. Welcome to this week's edition of On the Hill. Today we're fortunate enough to have Professor Fred Bauman of the Political Science Department here with us. John? I'd like to begin by asking you, um, I once attended a lecture that was given by the editor of Le Monde in which he said that everything is essentially political. You can't be objective in anything you try to do. What do you think about that statement? Uh, undoubtedly a political comment. Uh, look. I mean, it's a long McGillot, right? Uh, what, what about that? I think, for one thing, that statement is often taken to mean if it's political, therefore, basically, it's war. Mm -hmm. What that tends to forget is there are all kinds of political uh, relations. There's relations between Canada and the United States. Because relations are political doesn't mean you can't talk, doesn't mean you can't come to common agreement. At the same time, I don't ultimately agree with it. It seems to me it's based on philosophical arguments that, are, to me, are possibly correct, but not ultimately persuasive. The basis is in Nietzsche that argues that everything is fundamentally a matter of will, there's no truth, everything is self-assertion. And while they're very powerful arguments, I'm not persuaded by them. And therefore, I'm open to the possibility that there's some things that aren't political. Bill? Um, your recent article in the Kenyan Observer has prompted discussion on campus, and is what prompted John and I to invite you here this week. I had a question about uh, the liberal arts and the nature of the political um, intellectual arguments. Obviously, these are important things to the liberal arts, and the existence of the Kenyan Observer has spawned the discussion that, in fact, these are important and really part of the essence of the liberal arts. Yet, at the same time, there are or have been incidences within the community from the faculty which you said sometimes criticisms of this discussion are 
simply made cynically and out of a desire to silence. While this may happen in the sort of extracurricular affairs of the community, do you think there might be an inclination for this to happen also in the classroom as well when it comes to the debate? Well, my impression is that at Kenyon, by and large, that doesn't happen. And I'm very glad about that. And it's a sign of the, my sense is it's a healthy school and a healthy place. Uh, the, the problem you're really alluding to is a version of John's problem, uh, the problem that he raised, and it's, it's the fundamental question. That's the question of the is and the ought. Um, we study at university, we think we're trying to discover how things are, what the is is, and sort of science is the model of that. Then you get into the ought questions, so-called value questions in the humanities, and it seems often as though it's very hard to come to an agreement on those, maybe it's impossible. What, maybe what we're really doing is fighting. And how we coordinate the study of things where we're looking for what's true and the dealing with the argument about the ought is a traditional problem for universities. And there are old ways of dealing with it. The way that I ultimately prefer, and that's what I've said to you, is to understand the ought questions as potentially solvable by the is. And therefore, in the end, we shouldn't be fighting, but we should be discussing and trying to discover what really ought to be the case. But I know perfectly well that that's not the way it's going to work in real life, that people are, in fact, going to want to change things one way, have the curriculum be one way, and they will fight, and they will use the arts of fighting to do that. That is, in a way, contradictory to seeking and studying and trying to find the truth. And the problem is how to set up rules whereby we can have a compromise between them, how the science and the study for the, of the truth doesn't get taken over by politicization. And simply saying, well, everything is really political, it seems to me totally irrelevant. Yeah? Whether that's true or not is ultimately something which, if it is true, has to be discovered by study and by discussion. Yeah? Well, I would like to get to the, um, I, I have a kind of a problem with, uh, with faculty members fighting amongst each other and, and the way that's been going on with, with the, a group of people saying, well, you're a racist organization, that, you know, attacking the observer, attacking the people who, who write these articles. Um, what, what exactly, you know, wh what are people afraid of and why isn't there a spirited debate with, within, parameter, within certain parameters amongst the faculty? I mean, we look for you for, to leadership and what we're getting is this, well, you're a racist. Well, no, I'm not. You know, I mean, it's... Well, I, I regret that very, very much. I think to some extent it's not fair to the faculty to characterize it that way. That's uh, more extreme than I would do it. But look, I mean, let, let's face the facts. The American university, like, in a way, all of Western thought, is in a kind of crisis. The advantage of having old institutions and old traditions is that people have, in a way, encoded old solutions for how you deal with quarreling within parameters. Those are, for good reasons, under question now. The university is sociologically, historically, very different now than it was 50 years ago. And in a way, Kenyon is very different. You know, the traditions of we agree to disagree, we don't raise any terrible points that I think have probably characterized this place 50 years ago have changed because the American university has changed and the American thought has changed. So now we have to reinvent the wheel. We have to figure out what the rules are, and my article was an attempt to do that. But do you think people are really willing to put their opinions on the line? I mean, that's my question. I'd like to see, you know, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to name names, but a liberal and a conservative professor sit down and debate in front of the students and, and say, well, this is what I really believe in. Let's put it on the line. I mean, Well, I think that does happen here, and I'm very pleased with it. I mean, for instance, uh, last year there was discussion between Professor Broad and Professor Clore, example of that kind of thing. And we do that from time to time here, and I think we're, we're best when we do it. Um, and I've participated in such discussions often. Um, I would have said to you that by and large, or maybe a year ago, I would have said to you, by and large, I think academics everywhere tend to be people who aren't good at this kind of putting it on the line, precisely because uh, people who are academics don't particularly like to mix it up. That's one of the reasons we're academics, usually. Uh, I wonder so now, you're avoiding the real world? Well, yeah, to some extent. I think there's a temperamental inclination in that direction. Not Obviously not true of everybody, but uh, I think for many of us, and myself included, I think, yeah, sure, this is these are worlds within worlds, and we like them. Um, but on the other hand, I think maybe it's true that the particular history of Kenyon uh, has led to a kind of dominance of hurt feelings, a world that's sort of half war, half peace, where we don't really know the rules and we don't feel confident about them. And I think to some extent we have to re-educate ourselves in how to conduct ourselves as faculty and as students and staff and everybody and what these parameters are. 
wherein we can fight. And I want to say something in a way semi-personal. The model that I like to use of how this kind of fighting works well is you guys. I think our 1-2 class was the best class I've ever taught. And what made it best was not that you were the greatest students, because indeed you were not, <laughs> but that you had a kind of spirit, a kind of spirit of give and take and amusement and enjoying your own company as you fought. Uh, that uh, affected the whole class and made it a wonderful class. Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> Does not that the fact that the faculty are a little bit reluctant to enter into this thing put the student in a bit of a predicament? Because if this is part of what the liberal arts is supposed to help students discover, the rules of the game, and the faculty are to a certain extent not embracing that game or in fact not endeavoring to rediscover the rules of the game, what sort of situation does that put the students in? Well, I mean, you're living, as we all are, in a kind of period of readjustment, or if you want to put me dramatic about it, crisis, uh, where we all are trying to learn the alphabet again. And uh, what we're trying to do here and throughout is to relearn the rules. So, you know, welcome to the problem. How are we going to solve this practically? Well, what we're doing today. Uh, you know, what Professor Spade did. He risked something. He wrote an article. He thought maybe he was going to get chewed up. I think that was really admirable. My reply to him, this debate, these things are worked out by discussion, which gets back to the very first point, namely that, in my view, it is through talking in a friendly way about the problems that we learn most. So in essence, we're on our road to the solution. Well, we're on our road to something, and maybe it's a solution. Well, that's all for this edition of On the Hill. I'm John Grant. And I'm Bill O'Hearn. I'd like to thank Professor Bauman for coming and sharing his views with us today. Thank you very Next much. week, we'll have another surprise guest. The senior class committee has not yet chosen a commencement speaker, at least not one that is accepted as of yet. A popular rumor around campus early this week has been that President George Bush was slated as this year's commencement speaker. Other rumors suggest that Paul Newman has accepted Kenyon's invitation to address its first graduating class of the decade. A source close to President Jordan has dismissed these rumors. However, this source confirmed that Kenyon did indeed ask President Bush to speak and that the President tentatively accepted the invitation. According to our source, the senior class committee and President Jordan feared that a presidential visit would take just too much attention away from this year's graduating seniors. Nevertheless, Bush later replied with a firm no to Kenyon's invitation. Well, we may not be able to tell you who the commencement speaker will be this year, but we can tell you that the senior class has chosen this year's senior class gift. The senior class will be giving a brand new sapling, a white oak sapling, to replace the fallen white oak in front of Ross Hall. The tentative date for the planting is April 4th at 4 o'clock. In recognition of Homeless Awareness Week, Pimentos for Gus will be joined by the Kingfishers for a benefit concert on Friday, March 30th from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. in the KC. Free refreshments will be provided and local artisans will be on hand to show their wares. Donation uh, accepted and encouraged is a dollar. And of course, all that money will go to Habitat for Humanity. The newly formed pro-choice organization on campus is sponsoring a coffee house this Saturday, March 31st from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. at the KC. The cover charge will be $1. T-shirts, buttons, and bumper stickers will be available along with free refreshments. The Coco Singers, the Owl Creek Singers, the Chasers, Pimentos for Gus, as well as the Chasers will be performing at this coffee house. The Knox County Sheriff's Office has reported a missing person. David Allen Yoakum, a 15-year-old from Knox County, has been reported missing since the 15th of this month. He was born in 1974 and weighs 157 pounds. He's five foot, seven inches tall. He has blue eyes and red hair. If you have any information on this missing person, please call 393-0970 or call the Knox County Sheriff's Department at 397-3333. We at the station will, of course, keep you updated on information on David Allen Yoakum. Well, that's all the news we have for you this week. Join us next week. We'll have footage of the senior lip sync competition. We'll also have a more complete story on the new women's softball club. In addition, we'll have information on the national search for a new athletic director, as well as a new edition of On the Hill, where John Grant and Bill O'Hearn will have a studio guest discussing gay and lesbian life here at Kenyon. Thanks for joining us. This has been KCTV News.